Here is John Fleming. Now, John, <clears throat> you and I at, probably have known one another for 30 years, but it was always spotty. It was kind of off and on. It was when there was different things, especially when food was involved. You were the chief planning officer <clears throat> for the city of London during during that time. <clears throat> and I remember meeting with you different things and really liking you. You were just very engaging. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was good, but we never got to spend all that much more time with one another. But over the years, we worked on some really interesting things. And yeah. then you retired. Mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> I, re I remember thinking, I, I, I had announced shortly around the time of your retirement that the food bank was going to build a greenhouse. And uh, I announced it on CBC. And I, I'd never built a greenhouse before. I'd never really <laughs> been in one, didn't really know what I was doing. And then I thought I could use some help. So at that time, I remember I phoned you and asked you for coffee. And we went for coffee and you had just retired. And you didn't know much about greenhouses either. You well, also never, yeah. you never really built one either. And then we decided, we formed this pack. We would get together. We would do this, you know, uh, 30 by 70 foot greenhouse, 15 feet high at the back of the food bank. And then we got this fellow named Luis from Chile that people will know here pretty well. Thank goodness. As outsiders help us with some of the heavy lifting. Yeah. But really, it was the three of us. And I would have to say that for me, I've been at the food bank 36 years. Those are some of the best times I've ever had at the food bank. Oh, it's nice to hear me it too. was a summer. We learned. We made so many mistakes. We <laughs> laughed. It, it was just a really good time. How was that time for you? I mean, you had just come out from being chief planning officer of the city. Now you're into retirement, but you definitely didn't want to retire. You were looking for other things for yourself. How was that time for you? Yeah. Well, I would describe it as a bit of a confusing time for me um, because I've been working for 30 years at the city. Um, pretty big world in terms of lots of travel, uh, reaching out to lots of different people and, um, you know, meetings every day. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, boom, retired from the city. And now I'm at home in my family room uh, looking at my dog. And my dog's great. Don't get me wrong. Um, but uh Confusing in terms of, well, what am I going to do next? Um, it wasn't so much around the financial side of things. It was more around the what's fulfilling, what's the opportunity out there uh, to work on something that I feel is meaningful. Yeah. And um, then COVID, of course, came along and that made it even more of a sort of isolation piece. But uh, what was amazing is that uh, along came Glenn Pearson. And uh, yeah, that fateful day we had coffee was uh, the one that sort of got yeah. me moving forward on this idea of um, working together with you to help community in that way. And I had a long history already of uh, working on food-related yeah. uh, issues from a planning point of view. So this was a really cool opportunity for me to get my hands dirty, to actually you know, get out of the policy-making or... Uh, community networking and the conversation side of urban agriculture and get into actually doing it. And so that was really exciting for me, Glenn. And uh, boy, we, like you say, I, I feel the same way. We had a great time. We were laughing every day. And uh, when I think back to uh, what we didn't know, I thank goodness you don't know what you don't know, mm. but we did not know uh, a lot. <laughs> mm. And so, um, you know, I think a, a blessing was uh, um, Luis, but it yeah. came from nowhere. Um, actually, it was uh, somebody from the community that suggested that Luis was somebody that had recently come to London and would be a great match to possibly work with the food bank in some way. And um, yeah. that, that was big for us, wasn't it, Glenn? Because, uh, it was. I mean, if it was up to me. I think we would have been growing greenhouse food in the ground and um all of our plants would have been baked and we would have never made it uh, <laughs> so uh thank goodness i mean luis was sort of looking at me when i was talking and i, I can remember him kind of this look on his face like these these people really don't know what they're doing at all yeah so he's been great but i had such a great time glenn i want to i'll take the opportunity now to say thanks for uh bringing me into the fold and uh giving me something really fulfilling and enriching to work on I think what we, uh, what I, 
it wasn't me, but if, if, if I brought into the fold anything, it was this expansive mind of yours. One of the problems with anybody in a discipline like food banking, and let's say you want to do a greenhouse, is that you, you could just concentrate and focus in on that, and that's it. My desire for doing the greenhouse was I really felt that urban agriculture really needed to expand in London. There were so many groups that were working on it, had been so faithful at it for decades, right? right? And were trying to get it on the public policy agenda. They were trying to get it on funders agenda, so on and so forth. And, and I just didn't feel it was making it. Uh, but I did, uh, despite all of their efforts, but I did feel that the food bank had such a high profile at that time that it why doesn't the food bank throw some of its weight in uh and, and see if we can maybe make something happen that would bring public attention and media attention to all the great work that these other groups had done and that you had done and and i think uh what i really appreciated working about with you is that you and i would often sit down sometimes for hours at a time and try to figure out how to put up this portion of the greenhouse we didn't know but more often than that, we spent hours and hours and hours discussing the need for urban agriculture in the modern community. You had been the chief planner for the city of London. You had helped to pull together the London plan. And part of all of that was about urban agriculture as well. You were trying to make room in that for the future. How did you bring that part of it about? I'm talking about the London plan. How did you, mm -hmm. how did you figure urban agriculture should be a key part of that? Yeah, well, the first thing I'll say is I, I agree with you. We, we spent lots of time talking about not just growing food, but the implications of growing food for community, economy, environment. And we spent a lot of that time on your porch. Um, and that porch has had, uh, for the record, prime ministers, governor generals, uh, mayors, uh, everybody uh, under the sun, um, community groups developers um uh, anyway so um it, it was nice to have that kind of opportunity to talk about um the the very uh real and tactile version of growing food and yeah. also its implications for the big picture and where do we go as a community so that took me back to um yeah uh, back to about 2013 2014 when we're going through um, the preparation of the London plan. So what is the London plan? It's the blueprint for growth for the community of London. I mean, that's a big responsibility. We're talking about the next 20 to 30 years of growth. We're talking about a city that's reaching close to half a million people, a regional center. It's an important city, somewhere around 12th, 13th, uh, largest in Canada. And um, here we're trying to figure out what are priorities in the community and what surprised us as we went through what we called rethink london it was a uh, it's been called the biggest uh engagement around an official plan at the time anyway in canada's history um so a very fulsome conversation um across the city of what is uh, of key priority to londoners for our future mm -hmm. guess what food came up over and over again and, you know, we're planners. We don't really think too much. We're in this urban setting. We don't think too much about food. And, um, well, London's probably around 60% agriculture, agricultural land. So it does make sense to a certain degree. But we really, you know, from a planning point of view, we didn't spend too much time on that. We left that to uh, municipalities surrounding uh, the city of London. And there wasn't as much sort of regional ties, you know, looking back as as there should have been. But anyway, this conversation around the blueprint for the future, the London plan, uh, as it was eventually called, the official plan for the city. Um, really, you know, through those consultations, we realized that food was important. So we did something that has never, at least as far as we were aware, wasn't done before. And that was create a specific policy in an urban community like London. Uh, chap a, a whole chapter devoted to food systems. And so this was essentially realizing that London has a food system that needs to be strengthened. And the food system includes growing, it includes uh, processing, it includes uh, the distribution of food, includes the preparation of food, eating, community, um, ties to uh, the environment, climate, 
And this whole system needs to be considered in a big picture way. And we need to think about ways that we as a municipality, but as a broader community can support our urban food system. And uh, yeah, that was the start of it. So there's actually a chapter in the official plan. I think it's been replicated in other plans uh, across the country since then in, in some some cases. But you know what, Glenn? Um, the London plan departed from a lot of official plans that were prepared in that we, we wanted to get away from the bureaucratic approach to official plans, that this is a planner's document and nobody else should be reading it. Um, we had a little bit of a joke that we wanted to make it so beautiful so that if somebody was at the hair salon, something that I, I'm not, I kind of remember what hair salons are, but um, if somebody was there and they looked at two documents, one maybe being Vanity Fair or GQ or something like that, and the other one being the London plan, they just might reach for the London plan because it's something that's accessible and didn't just deal with the bureaucratic and sort of regulatory side of planning, but it was also an inspirational document. Yeah. So this is where those food policies, that food chapter really came in, that idea of let's plan big picture uh, for food systems. Um, and part of that led to the next piece, which was uh, the urban agriculture strategy. So there was something in the food system policies in the plan that says, hey, the community should pre prepare an urban agriculture strategy. Yeah. And such things aren't perfect, though. I mean, it was I was part of all of that when you did it, not not with you, but I was at the meetings about the London plan that we had so much public input and others. It, it was wonderful. I remember you had Peter Mansbridge down to talk right. about the convention center. You had over a thousand people there. I mean, there was a lot of excitement about that. But with even with all of that, these are things that a community has to learn. It has to kind of become, pardon the pun, but it has to be kind of come organic within the community. So you have it in its conceptual stage. But then when you move to the implementation stage, it can be something a bit different. And you and I discovered this kind of by accident. I mean, we sat here with this greenhouse, right? We had to do so much work to figure out where we were going to get it from. You know, yeah. we had to do kind of an environmental assessment and other things with it. And, and we went ahead and with all of these other groups and all of the support that we had, what we realized was that your instincts and that of your planning team had been correct. That when you put together the London plan and put in a chapter about urban agriculture, you you folks felt that there was going to be support for that. And the greenhouse has been our number one, the most popular program that we have ever done. And it was been like that from day one. And it it kind of verifies what you and your team had been saying. Excuse so me. there you have it. Mm -hmm. You know, you have all of these groups, constructions, trades groups, and others who are helping us build the greenhouse. Yeah. It was there. The public donated. All these organizations donated. We built this greenhouse. We're getting ready to grow in it. And then all of a sudden we realized we couldn't really zone it. <laughs> Exactly. And, and that was a revelation to you. It was a revelation to me. And at that point, John, you and I had a decision to make. We could ask for an exemption because it was such a popular program and just hope that the city would give us an exemption, let us go on. Or we could look at it and say, this is a prototype for things to come. And therefore, we should go through that process and take the time and work with the city uh, to make it work. Um, I'm kind of wondering... What your feeling was right then, I mean, this is the kind of thing that you had in mind when you mm -hmm. wrote the London plan. And then all of a sudden, when it came to the implementation stage, there were some hiccups that had to be overcome. What, what was your frame of mind during those days? Well, I'd say there's a couple of things, Glenn. The first one was being on the other side of the counter is mm -hmm. such a good thing. And, you know, if I were to go back in time, I think what I would do is uh, come up with some sort of program to get my staff, planners, um, and others to be on the other side of the counter. And maybe it takes going to another municipality so that that, you know, is actually politically, you know, meets the optics test. But as soon as you're on the other side of the counter, you start to see things that you wouldn't um, mm -hmm. when you're regulating, when you're creating policy, even though you're having conversations with those that might be struggling through those things or working with um, policy and regulation, you, you really don't 
feel it the same way you do until you have a project that you're working on and you come up against some sort of policy or regulation that is, is difficult to work through. So as I said, we started out with the food systems policies, and then we went to the urban ag strategy. And one of the, the urban ag strategy, something we can talk about later, either today or, or some other time, but one of the recommendations was that the city look at policy and regulations that might be barriers to urban agriculture, the kinds of things that we wanted uh, to see happen and to refine the official plan zoning bylaw, site plan bylaw and other things to make those things happen. And um, it hadn't been done uh, yet. So official plan 2016, and here we were in 2021, I think trying to build this, uh, mm -hmm. this greenhouse 2020, 2021. So um, yeah, the first thing I felt was frustration, a little bit of anger, how can we make this happen? You know, put on the problem solving hat. And it wasn't anger at anyone in particular. It's just more a kind of or frustration. It's more just this feeling of, ah, this is exactly what everyone wants to see, and we can't do it because of the existing policy. So there are things in the zoning bylaw, for example, that said um, you can't have a greenhouse over a certain size within an urban area. Mm -hmm. uh, it also said that if you have it as an accessory use, um, you have to count the square footage of both the primary building and the greenhouse against the total square footage allowed on the lot, which means that very difficult to do a greenhouse of any size, or you're gonna get caught up in that uh, size limitation. Yeah. Even said things like, if you're growing in the zoning by law, if you're growing for the purpose of selling, your either food or particularly the, the plants, if you're growing for purposes of some sort of horticultural greenhouse, you're going to sell different uh, trees and bushes and plants, then you have more latitude for having a greenhouse in the urban parts of the city and urban zones mm -hmm. than if you're growing it for the purpose of growing food, either to sell or to give out. Um, there are also site plan requirements, which are really quite onerous um, and expensive in terms of what we had to submit. Um, and then there were building code uh, restrictions that apply across the country, um, but particularly in the province, that were so onerous dealing with things like flame spread and wind load and snow load. I mean, honestly, how is a plastic covering going to meet things like wind and snow load um, requirements? So there are some obvious pieces there that yes, it needs to be addressed so that it was safe, but there were ways that it could be handled. So it, there was even a significant parking requirement that went along with greenhouses so that the floor space of a greenhouse would pretty much be equal to the floor space of a retail use um, or some sort of manufacturing use uh, when it comes to the requirement for parking. So these were things that were significant obstacles to making the very thing everybody wanted to see happen yeah. happen yeah. and it was almost like on one hand please you know the city saying please do this and i was part of that and then on the other hand here's all the obstacles that are in your way um now i will say that i have to put this in glenn that um as we work through this the city did work with us and uh, you know i think we owed a, a great debt of gratitude to some of the folks in building and planning um, even community services and engineering with servicing, there were a bunch that had to come to the table and help us work through all of this. Yeah. But the key was that all of these regulatory hoops and hurdles were there that were that would stymie the average person from wanting to do this. And it was only because of you and Jane and the food bank uh, and, and your commitment to make this happen that it actually did. So that's, Glenn, where we started to look at paving the way for others. And making changes. I think what was great about that, John, is, you, is I was saying you helped me to see the the bigger picture, and I th I think it's good. But you know, when you think about it, we had to work through planning department, the zoning department, the building department. All of these things are put in there, and they're all good. They're like fire codes, things like that. They're there for a reason. They do protect right. the public, right? All that kind of stuff. However, they also are developed in a time that is uh, innovation comes along later on and is able to change some of those things, but right. the codes aren't quite there. But what I really appreciated about what happened there, John, is that 
we were actually had help from the political side in London that came and saw us and said, look, we'll bring this before council. We'll get you the exemption, those kind of things. And and we refused. And I think if it would have been just for the food bank and just moving forward and getting it done, maybe we would have taken them up on that. I don't know. But this was for the community. This is for the mm-hmm. London plan. This was for the urban ag piece of the London plan. And if we're not going to go through that and help the city to understand what it's like from the other side of the counter, as you have said, and if we're not going to understand better what the city, the constraints it's feeling, then it will just go be kicked down the road and somebody else will have to face that the next time they want to try something. So I, I, I really think I enjoyed that experience as frustrating as it was. I enjoyed the experience because the city did come and work with us and realize that we were trying to do that. And overall, it has really worked out. And, you know, I I look back at it now, we now have greenhouses throughout the city, about 25 of them. Now, they're all smaller in size. And as a result, they're also on private land, like churches, things like that. So they don't have to go through those hoops because of their size. They fall Mm -hmm. below that level. And also because they're on private land. so, you know, the city didn't stand in our way with that. So we've been able to take that greenhouse movement and, and move it through. Right. But I, I must admit that the working with the city on that, as challenging as it was, really helped me to see how important it was. Right. And I think I went one step further, Glenn, and that is that um, we could have got through our greenhouse and be done with it. You know, yeah. go through the zoning amendment process, uh, go through the building code pieces, servicing, et cetera, et cetera, site plan. But rather than just doing that, we reached out to the city and said, we think that there need to be changes to zoning regulations, site plan, official plan policies, building code considerations. And so we asked council, the food bank specifically asked council if planning staff would work with us, building staff, et cetera, to um, look at these hoops, these barriers. And um, we offered that we would do a planning analysis so that I could bring my experience, Mm -hmm. do a planning analysis of what are the barriers and how do we make urban agriculture easy? And that's what I call the document that uh, we prepared. And we submitted it to the city and um, with the direction of council, but with the cooperation of the planning office, who is great on this, they took our recommendations they tweaked them um, so that they work from their perspective. And um, yeah, th- there's some major changes that were made to the official plan and zoning bylaw so that a project like ours would now conform to zoning. Yeah. And there's limitations in terms of, uh, you know, very scoped, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of what has to be dealt with through site plan. And there's an understanding, I think, in building or as to how to, Kind of give some flexibility to make things happen while still um, conforming to building code and maybe looking a little bit at the uh, Canadian um, farm building code, recognizing this is a farm building, yeah. um, those kinds of things. And so I feel good about the fact that we have sort of taken the bull by the horns, not just worked through our own project, but now yeah. paved the way for others. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of a perfect um community piece when you think of it it starts over a cup of coffee <clears throat> with uh you know somebody who's retired who has lots of energy yet to give to this community which you do and expertise and somebody else who's interested in acquiring that knowledge that other person has so you sit down at the tim hortons on spring bank you talk over this stuff and then you begin to move forward and then in come other community partners in comes the media in come the construction trade unions that would help us to build it in come these just average people dropping off money and, and 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 seeds and things like that to try to to get the whole thing going right and then in come the volunteers it's it's everything that's supposed to happen in a community when an idea germinates it's kind of like the community is supposed to be a greenhouse itself of ideas so as these kind of things happen it's great but if you want it to matter you have to do the tough stuff that's just the way that it is. You can grow it in your backyard if you want, benefit for yourself if you wish. But if you're trying to help take the community to the next level that the London Plan talked about, you have to take on those different difficult things about zoning and other things, even if you have the money, even if you have the volunteers, the public will, the community support, it's all there. 
But if you want to try to rush that through the city and everything else when it can't be ready for others that are doing it, you know, I think that there's no help in that. Just because it's a success at that level doesn't make it a success at the community level. Nice. And I think thanks to your influence, John, and I really mean that, I think you've really helped us as a food bank to realize, get tough, you know, work through these things, take, you know, go ahead, get started, but use your vision so it's for the community and not just for yourself. And I hope that for you, you and I are going to do a second one of these, I hope, maybe next week even, John, because mm-hmm. I want to expand the London plan farther and a bit of what you're doing and other things. But And I know you're teaching at Western. I know you run your own small business so we can get into some of those things. But I'm, I'm so thankful you never left London after you're retired because I think we're all learning how to take a, an idea and germinate it in a way that it becomes policy. It's totally different than having an idea and it gets realized. It's totally right. different when it's policy because when it's policy, it's for everybody. Yeah. And I think you've really done that for us. And you've really done that for me. And I don't, I don't think the community appreciates you enough. You can do the big, huge plan and the London plan with your staff. Fantastic. The fact you could take a greenhouse and somehow turn it into policy, I think is a bit of a minor miracle. Well, Glenn, I, um, I didn't leave London because I love London. You know, mm-hmm. um, and that's, that's why I'm still here. It's a great city. It's my, you know, I, I, grew up here so it's my town and uh i love the community so it's not just you know the physical part of london or what's happening but the the people and yeah but but i also want to say that i think that what you've shown to me very clearly is that you can only do so much as a municipal official either elected or or in the um administrative side of things and it really is so important for community to drive the city they want to live in. Mm-hmm. And I know that it's tough because the politics at all three levels are, it's difficult to feel sometimes like it's an expression of what community is looking for. But that really is, I think, in, in my view, what's so critical is that people stay very active that they push for what they want, that they don't disappear and shrug their shoulders and say, well, oh, well. And um, I think you've really shown me that in, in our conversations that really it's the community that's going to save us. We can't be sitting back and thinking that all of the political forces that are out there in the governments are going to um, you know, work through so many of these difficult issues that confront us right now. It's got to start with community. Yeah. And of course, um, governments will there are an expression of community so they will follow and they will support yeah john thanks we're out of time i thank you for sticking around thanks for reinvesting back in london but i think we'll do round two next week if you're good with that yeah sure we We need to then take it further where does food take us from this point on right? Uh, You know, where does urban agriculture take us from this point on? So let's do that round next week and, and, and keep pursuing it. But it takes, you have to, (laughs) you know, the old Ontario song, a place to plant, place to grow Ontario area. area. That's also true at a Mm -hmm. local community. And you've helped us to start there. And now we have to take that and germinate it and grow it. So let's talk next week about how we're going to do that. Thanks for all you've done for us as a food bank and for the community, John, not just right now, but for all the years you committed to the city to oh, help us to this point. It's just my thank you for believing in the community still. And rather than moving on, you stayed, you've made it work. And now we're beginning to see, see some of the fruits of all the efforts you and your team have put into it. Thank you for that. Well, Glenn, it's been a great pleasure working with you. And thanks very much for having me today. Glad to chat anytime. Thanks, John.